Welcome everyone. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an ocean elder, National Geographic explorer, residence, founder of Mission Blue, <laughs> friend of Liz. <laughs> <laughs> this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. And miraculously, I have managed to screen share. <laughs> <laughs> and the one um, thing that we start with every time is to just remind everybody. The world is, is blue. blue. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Isn't that beautiful? Um, let's see. During the program, you can put questions by writing them into the Q&A box. And we will get to as many of them as we can towards the end of the program. And uh, we will try to uh, see if we can accommodate raised hands as well. I'll try to look for those. And today we are going to be talking about horseshoe crabs. We're being joined by John Tanacredi. Uh-oh, here he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's he, the one on the left. That's right. John, you can turn your uh, camera and video on whenever you like. Um, John's a professor of earth and environmental studies at Malloy College, there he is. Uh, and he's an expert on the health of the Long Island coastal ecosystem. I first met John, uh, actually Easter Island. We were there on a trip together. It was a Explorers Club flag expedition and we were doing studies on climate change and collecting some uh, core samples and, and so forth there. But and, no horseshoe crabs. But no horseshoe crabs there at all. No. <laughs> but after that trip, he sent me this awesome book, Lemulus in the Limelight. Limulus being the name, the genus of horseshoe crabs. And, Limulus, yes. And you wrote the uh, introduction for this awesome yes, book. a little salute to John <laughs> and the horseshoe crabs. But the horseshoe crabs, here's here's a fake horseshoe crab. Yes. They played such a, a great role in, in my childhood. I remember finding these guys on the beach and, um, you know, just always being really amazed by their their cool shape and wondering what the heck they do. And and you grew up with them as well. Actually, I credit horseshoe crabs for luring me into the ocean. When I was a little kid in New Jersey, they were trying to get out uh, of the ocean to come up on the beach <laughs> to lay their eggs. The males and females came often as a couple and I thought they should be in the ocean. So I spent a lot of time trying to put them back in the ocean. And they waited until I got out of sight. They crawled <laughs> and then they went, back out. And they crawled back out again. <laughs> <laughs> how about had, you, John? How, how did you get involved in horseshoe crabs? It, it was a, a little subdued, um, but um, in, um, and I, I mentioned the, the year because um, it was a, a critical year in, 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 um, in my life anyway. Uh, 1965, I was, uh, I graduated high school and for that last year, that senior year, I, I would walk to a, a place um, in Brooklyn called Coney Island. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, walked to Coney Island to go uh, fishing off the fishing pier. And there was the New York Aquarium, uh, which was there part of the uh, New York Zoological Society, which with William Beebe and all of the ocean experts exploration. It was a mecca it, and it had the Osborne Laboratories for Marine Science. And in the laboratory, um, I, I volunteered as a docent. And so I cleaned a lot of glassware, endless <laughs> glassware. And, but I snuck, I used to sneak into where all the scientists were. There were four Nobel laureates that worked in that laboratory at some point in time. But I would go into the the scanning electron microscope room, SEM, because they had a scientific illustrator there. And she was amazing because I was kind of an art nerd. I wasn't very good, but I was interested in sketches and drawings. And so I would sneak in to watch the work that she was doing. And to this day, I, it, it just always gets me excited to see the artistic aspect of, of nature, uh, in addition to a photograph, but there's nothing like a sketch that can really, um, we have a little bit close to that today in, in computer uh, graphics, but a, a good artwork is always tremendously accurate and it 
it just transcends into what you do in the field. The field observations are all the time. So anyway, I'm at the New York Aquarium and uh, they had this ooh and ah exhibit. They would have this water falling over and all the, the little ones would go, ooh, ah. So I would be standing there and I would be holding horseshoe crabs and, and just showing them. And that kind of got, a, but that was really early on into, I was always interested in science and reading, but it wasn't until I, I came back to the museum to talk to George Ujiri, who was the director of, of the uh, aquarium, not museum, the aquarium. And, um, and he, he wrote a book that I had read that particular summer called The Healing Sea. And it talked about um, getting pharmaceuticals from marine organisms and, and, and there's a whole host of them. And then fast forward, to um, working with uh, the National Park Service. I was involved as um, a coastal, my title, coastal uh, research ecologist for the National Park Service. So everything from Maine to Gulf Islands. And we had a, a center at University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. And we would work on that and um, on just about anything on the coastline, but we honed in on the horseshoe crabs on, from Delaware Bay, and I had met Carl Schuster, and I met him at, at the aquarium, I and have a big um, book right here, and Hal Haskins, sure. and and yeah. Carl Carl's book was is the kind of the of biblical proportions what you what you look at you look at <laughs> <laughs> and then and and then I worked as I was working toward my PhD years later. Um, I did a, f a few years in New Jersey at, at Rutgers at the at their um, engineering uh, program, but I worked took all my ecology courses with Hal Haskins, and Hal Haskins was the oyster maven of uh, the universe. And Hal used to say to me all the time, "Jack, you know the thing you want to look at is looking at those horseshoe crabs needs a lot of work." So I said, "All right, we'll take a look at that." But I, the Park <laughs> Service was more habitat protection. And, um, and so it was kind of a combination of things, but you have to be mesmerized. All you have to do is go one time to Delaware Bay to, to see this intensive interaction between migration, between use of habitat. And, and it's interesting, even in this picture here, where you see in the background, all of the homes on pilings all over. I mean, that today, that's that's one of the, the concerns we have along the coastline about the development up to the coastline. Oh, sure. right and so, um, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, uh, and that idea of development or engineering and infrastructure um, and how it influences everything from horseshoe crabs to, the, to what they support all really started in looking at national parks along the coastline. Because in, for all intents and purposes, whatever the designation for the park is, it is still preserved in perpetuity. That was the whole idea, the organic act and the creation of the national park system. And um, you, you start out with that preservation mandate um, and then where the little uh, details or the, the, the debates that go on have to do with uh, use, the use of right. those coastlines. But you gotta preserve the habitat. You don't preserve the habitat, you really have a, a very, very difficult time beyond that. I mean, that, that should be the, primary concept of that type of thing. So that's my short history. <laughs> for Very good. Getting and involved these, with orchard crabs. And these are such ancient animals. I mean, they've, and they're not even true crabs. I mean, they're most closely related to spiders and other arachnids. Scorpions. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they cer right. certainly are, um, they're arthropods. And so they're related to scorpions and, and spider, uh, spiders, arachnids. Um, uh, but they have their, their own, family, the, the chalicerae, and chalicerae are animals with their mouth parts surrounded by their legs, it's and that in itself cool. makes them pretty interesting, and and they are paleo survivors, 455 million years, give or take a week or two in there, um, <laughs> from the standpoint of these animals crawling around under the under the legs of brontosauruses and dinosaurs, they, they outlasted all the dinosaurs, um, they even outlasted their closest uh, relatives at the time, the Eurypterids, which is the New York State fossil, and of course, um, uh, the, the, uh, the trilobites. And the trilobites 
were incredibly diversified. And when you take a look at um, um, Niles Eldridge at the Museum of Natural History, we talk about this all the time in, in looking at the diversity of trilobites in paleo history um, in the, from the Cambrian on, they, they started out with fairly simple design and then they became all these exotic looking animals and they're all gone. Um, yeah. Horseshoe crabs, for all intents and purposes, even somebody with an initi initial understanding of them and having studied them, you take a look at all the, there's only four species on earth uh, of horseshoe crabs, but if you looked at the paleo limuli and you look at the earliest fossilized remains, it's very difficult to even tell the difference, even if you're, you've been studying horseshoe crabs, you, you can, uh, and actually most of the fossilized remains were either um, molts uh, that fossilized uh, or their tracks and trails, which may have been covered over by a volcanic eruption or something that caught, took uh, frozen time, that particular activity of, of the moving along the coast. And, uh, and I, think, I think that's one of the major things. And I, there's, there's four basic kind of themes associated with horseshoe crabs. Um, one is its pale survival. Um, to, to have survived five mass extinction events in Earth history, that alone should be enough to Stunning. preserve them for, <laughs> forever in human history. And so it's always difficult when I when I kind of say that, oh, well, they're living fossils and they go, well, you know, I'm a living fossil. But the whole bottom line <laughs> is when you look at these animals in their habitat needs, um, they have gone through incredible changes in the environment over time. So it, they may not survive us. That's John. true. Yeah. They may not survive us. Yeah. And that is so true. And that and that is that is for reasons that they never even had. And and I, I mean it's it's one thing to lose habitat, it's one thing to lose uh them for predation or natural. Um, you know, paleontologists talk about um, um the length of time that species exist on the planet, uh, the clade, the, the idea of one to two million years on average, depending on the species. Uh, dinosaurs predominated um, for 125 million years on Earth and tremendous diversity, tremendous sizes. These animals didn't. These animals were, were predominant in the early uh, coastlines. They, they, their cycle, their, their entire reproductive cycle uh, is, hasn't changed really uh, that we can uh, understand. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and the idea that they're invertebrates makes it because when you look at invertebrates in general, if you're talking about coral reef systems, they tend to be more sensitive to environmental perturbations than, than the larger animals. Uh, so, and again, I'm making a general statement there. There are examples of, of all of these things. But uh, for example, the, the horseshoe crabs have a reproductive cycle um, that from the standpoint of what we do at Malloy College, and at the Center for Environmental Research and Coastal Oceans Monitoring, CIRCOM, which is our field station, uh, the main thing at the field station is captive breeding of horseshoe crabs. And um, and there's a whole story right there. We may have to go into two whole sessions. We will, but, but you so, know, you're, you're saying, you know, you, the, the idea of managing on... horseshoe crabs on, on along the coastline is, is the thing, but they're invertebrates, so they molt, and the males molt 16 times, in a nine-year cycle, and females molt 17 times in an 11-year cycle before they're sexually mature. They're not sexually mature until nine or 11 years. So here you have this incredible expanse of time, this tremendous fecundity, the re reproduction of these eggs, that, like you see in this picture, yeah, right? This picture, yeah. They're just, I mean, they're, they come ashore female. and they just start laying those eggs and and putting them down in the sand. Yeah. And you can and, see and the little guys developing there. Here's a hand. Above them. That, that's a single clutch. A single female will put between 80 and 120,000 eggs in a season. Uh, they'll, they'll burrow in and nest along the shoreline. And then there's, a, there's usually, um, as you can see here, um, a lot of other predation going on because the, the well, red knots, ready turnstones, uh, coastal birds, uh, that are migrating at the same time, synchronizing th that migration, uh, they literally triple in their body weight and they're constantly eating um, the eggs. 
uh, whether they're at the surface, uh, churned up in, in, uh, in tides or tidal cycles. Um, but the idea of each of the females that are in here, there's a, a single male that will, and you look at their physiology, their, their first appendages are little hooks. They, it's called amplexus. Um, there's actually a groove on the exterior of the carapace of the female. So you know that it's reproductively uh, active. At, and uh, the, the idea of one male for the one female, um, it probably would have reduced the ability to have this genetic survival as well, because there's tons of satellite males that are about, um, and they're all um, uh, putting um, uh, sperm into the waters, into the coastline. It's really kind of a cornucopia of getting um, young juvenile horseshoe crabs going, and they've been doing it for 445 million years. So, and so they produce the birds by quite a lot. But these birds are, you know, they're they've got an amazing story as well because these these little red knots, you know, they're like this little robin sized bird, and yet they travel like 19,000 miles um, every year, and they and they show up at the same time as these as these horseshoe crabs come ashore, and they're absolutely yeah reliant upon that as you nutrition. say that nutrition and that abundance that these horseshoe crabs bring to the to the ecosystem they go from the arctic to the antarctic and back again stopping to along. tank up yeah, tank up. <laughs> that, right. that is that is the, the the most massive commute you could think of and when you think of when migrations there's skinny. tendencies for migrations like with maybe whales or some other yeah. where there's a large expanse of habitat but think about but, uh, this as an ecosystem that goes from one at one pole to the other, or right. at least polar region, yeah. and, not, not, and not it, the actual pole. But, it, but it, and it really drives home the point of needing to protect these sort of, you know, these, not just the flyways, but also the critical the areas critical areas and swimways and, and these interconnecting habitats that we've talked about in some of our other, other episodes yeah. where, you know, you can't just sort of protect them in one area. You've got to kind of protect all of it. All of it. Right. And, and right. But these birds, it's, the, it's you know. that linkage. It's that linkage that is is really important. And and um, I I worked for the U.S. Coast Guard for a few years as uh, it was called as an environmental administrator was the title. But I was preparing environmental impact statements for bridge and highway construction in seven states. And in those states, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard had the permit regulatory responsibility and in, uh, this is years ago, um, the Coast Guard was considered part of the US Department of Transportation at the federal level. And so I was a civilian and it worked in preparing these impact statements. And we would do these, these uh, coastal surveys, looking at where a bridge or a highway was gonna be replaced or a new one was coming in. And invariably we would, uh, on the East Coast of the United States, have to worry about the habitat that these animals were in. And we would say this all the time, you can't keep chopping up um, a, a coastline and putting it in patches. Those patches have to have some kind of connections. It could be, maybe fly over it, but you can't necessarily swim through it or go by it if you've got a highway blocking it off or you don't have tidal actions. So there was a constant battle all the time with you know, effective and efficient transportation versus right an engineer as a environmental engineer, uh, you, you say that, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and but you can't, you can't have a straight line all the time when you're talking about the coastline. Yeah, th this is another example of these animals from the standpoint of their habitat. They're only found on the east sides of continents, and, and right. this is it. They're, they're not distributed all over the world. No, they're so, very limited in their, in their distribution, really. And if you look at that, you might think, oh, gosh, must be a lot of them, but they're not. <laughs> Right. They're not, right. especially yeah. now in Asia, their numbers are even in more trouble than those along the eastern seaboard of North America. And yes, I, I agree totally, uh, Sylvia, because uh, in, in uh, Indonesia and in Singapore, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, China, uh, we know nothing about them in the Philippines. Uh, uh, none of the islands have been surveyed. There's only one island, the southern island in Japan, that has horseshoe crabs, and it's meager in the numbers. Uh, but in Singapore, on a, a monthly basis, 10,000 
animals are harvested, oh. bled out. All the blood is taken out and sent to for pharmaceutical use. And then they scoop out whatever is inside the, the carapace or the, the um, exoskeleton, um, uh, uh, the prosoma as it's called. And then um, they sell it for food. They put it in little plastic bags and they send it off to the fish market. Um, mm -hmm. And there never used to be a road from where these beaches were. And then the, the government um, built the road. So now they can bring a truck right there and put all these, uh, these animals on there, but they're eliminated. They're not in the breeding stock. They're not even talking about that. And you go on YouTube and they've got all of these menu slates. This, this has become one of, I, I jumped ahead to the fourth issue today, but it's the idea of exotic foods. I mean, yeah. this is the, the Asian palate is very, very unique in it. And, um, and even something like this, this picture here showing uh, harvest in, in the um, early 1900s, um, here the animal was harvested for fertilizer. Right. And as, as much as we have horrible things to say about fossil fuels, um, it's the replacement of horseshoe crabs for fertilizer with chemical fertilizers that prevented that from happening. Now, they're not harvested at this level, but their numbers, we don't really know what their numbers are. As a matter of fact, it's constantly uh, talked about how many horseshoe crabs are there off the shore. And right. I've heard everything from 2 million, 3 million to 12 million to 16 million, which means we don't know. We really we have don't have no know. idea. And no idea. How, long does, how long does the horseshoe crab live? Does anyone actually know that? Um, Carl Schuster used to say to me that um, he projected based upon terminal molts any encrusting organisms because they're little habitats themselves. Little, little islands, they're so cute. They're oh, like, oh like, yeah, <laughs> they are. I mean, there's tons of stuff growing on them. I mean, you name it, it grows on them. And I, I'm not sure how, what that means because it kind of kind of stays still for a little while. So um, the point is that uh, uh, we really don't know how many there are. And the they could live the most that Carl thought was maybe 25, 30 years, something along that line. And probably that could inch you know, the error bar is pretty wide on that, but um, maybe 40 years at most at, at this point. But even that's pretty, pretty good for pretty an invertebrate. Long time. Yeah, it's, it's a good so, long time. And But yeah. to see, you know, an image like this, it's sort of reminiscent of, you know, like we've seen stacks of bison skulls or we've seen stacks of abalone or conch, you know, other animals that we've just sort of taken for granted. and Passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons and just yeah. sort of like extracted them for these Really, and, and, and you know what? It changes the chemistry of the planet to take so much out of the ocean. And yes. the, the systems that constantly recycle nutrients, you know, taking whales out of the ocean really disrupted the nutrient cycle. The nitrates and phosphates that pass through whales and fertilize the plankton, the same is true with every living thing. But when you see an organism is has a place in the system and and we and, don't really you know in ignorance we have just broken those chains yeah and today it seems like the major threat or one of the major threats to the horseshoe crab is this you know taking them for for bait uh and chopping them up taking the, and particularly the females are kind of targeted so the, the really important reproductive egg bearing um animals are gathered up, priority. <laughs> are prioritized to be chopped up, uh, and they're using them to to bait traps to catch these other um, to catch these mollusks, or I guess they're a whelk. Uh, well, the some people here. call them a conch. Um, conch and uh, and um, the uh, an eel, American yeah, eel. Yeah, got a slide coming uh, up of the eels, but but even looking at cutting up a horseshoe crab to then extract th these animals, which you know, they're, it doesn't seem like they're going to be a very um, fast reproducer either, no, right? Uh -uh. No, they live a long time. <laughs> Living a long time. So, I mean, it's just this complete cycle of un, unsustainability. The, the, the only way that fishermen get away with is, is that they have a zero accounting base. These are right. regarded as free goods. Let's go get them. What's with it? Not free. There, we, sh we shouldn't be thinking of them as free. There's a price to be paid. All of us pay it. The earth pays it. The ocean pays it. A absolutely. It all lives. Yeah. And these absolutely. eels are, even these eels that, that you see here, you know, they'll, they'll take like a, 
a chunk of the female horseshoe crab, put it into these traps, and the eels are uh, they can't resist the you know the aroma of the of the eggs and the and the other uh, bio chemical markers that are let off from the essence of crab. Yeah, and it, well, it's you know, and, and it's like distressed crab, right? So it's putting out like these distressed come get me, come get me type things. Um, that that, uh, but the eels themselves are endangered at this point. And that and that's strange because when I was a kid, nobody could imagine they could ever be endangered. There were so many, and that's the same thing with horseshoe crabs. My dad was a kid. Nobody thought you could diminish the number of horseshoe crabs. But even by the time I came along, there were fewer. And look at it today. It's just tragic. That we think they're somehow there for us to take. <laughs> what gives us the right to eliminate a whole category of life? It is the toughest conservation message to bring across to the general public is the idea is, well, you still see them, you still yeah. can collect them. And fishermen will say to me, you know, I can find them all the time. I don't have any problem with that. They won't tell you where they're finding them because yeah. that's that's kind of the prerogative of the fishermen. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that as a negative statement. I'm just saying it as the reality is that no organism that has gone extinct was ever with large populations uh, immune from extinction. Right. Carrier pigeon, the perfect example of that. People yep. would shoot up in the sky, didn't have to aim, and the birds would be falling out of the sky. Um, the American bison, if it wasn't for Teddy Roosevelt and, and the Bronx Zoo, we wouldn't have uh, bison out west because of right. artificial insemination and taking them into the Bronx to do that. I tell them all, you know, Ted, tell people all the time. Yeah. Another, another Teddy. <laughs> another, yeah. <laughs> He's provided a haven for them. But it, it just seems so wrong, really. I mean, to see a horseshoe crab, this ancient animal, reduced to something you stuff into a sack and throw into a trap to crush them, crush them up, and then you know use it to to capture these you know these big uh, whelks, you know, these the conch. Uh, it's, it's perverse. It's, it's just strange, just so and it's perverse. and it's really feeding. Uh, it's not like anybody really needs to eat these whelks. It's again feeding a, a market a that's that's very yeah. much a choice that people. It's have. a luxury diet. It is a it is a niche kind of fishery, and but a fisherman will argue you're taking away even a portion of uh, anything that's going about uh, these two free. overly these two overly enthusiastic high school students. Um, um, people say don't hold it up by the tail, and they did it for a very short time, and, and, uh, and it didn't help harm the animal. This animal wasn't harmed. Uh, but I, I just want to go back for a second to the idea of their ecological significance. Uh, certainly from a conservation standpoint, they provide the, the protein boosts that these birds migrating thousands of miles for. But they have a subtler um, benthic ecological function in the benthos and mud flats. And, and as you come into estuaries, these animals are churning over sediments. Mm. They're moving, they're moving in the, the whole, I hate to use, it's kind of a hackneyed term, but the biogeochemical aspects of estuaries. Without them, they wouldn't have all of this bioturbation, which is very, very important. Yeah. And it's, at a, it's a micro level. No one sees this. You can't tell anybody about it. You can say, oh, well, they turn over the, the, the muds. Like, um, oh, but it's things. really a big part of, of their ecological play, what, they, what their function is. Um, and then the whole idea of, of, uh, of wetlands and the idea that, and th this is truly, um, uh, I, I kind of uh, grandiose in attitude, I think, in the idea that we can restore wetlands. And, and even when I was with the Park Service, the whole idea of wetland restoration, uh, no wetland, no marsh, no recreated marsh, no matter how extensive or expansive it is, has never in the literature or anything that I've ever read been brought back to the level of, of biomass and productivity that a virgin marsh is. Don't mess with it, leave it alone, don't develop it. And um, I, I just, um, in 2019, the end of uh, December, I just published The Redesigned Earth, my, my uh, new book on, on coastal engineering. The idea that engineers have this tremendous power to create and to restructure and to redesign. 
And one of the big things has to do with infrastructure and the whole idea of, of infrastructure eliminating habitat and that you can recreate marshes. Remember, there was the uh, oh, beaches, the whole proposal, a political approach at one point about that, a net zero loss of marshes. If I take away two by filling it in and making a condo unit, I can build you four more over here so you'll have twice as many marsh Crazy. acres. And it, it just never, John Teal, John Milgrid, you know, yeah. the, uh, life and death of the salt marsh identified it, that we put had to put a dollar value on every acre of marsh in order to try to protect it. But that same acre costs, you know, ex exceedingly a lot more today in storm protection and mud flats. I mean, people don't want to go necessarily. <laughs> I'd like a mud flat. Every I love mud flat. flats. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the uh, it, 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 that's one of the major functions, especially in, in for limulus. Uh, because the other three species are much, much more, um, much more area, smaller numbers, and spread out over much larger areas uh, in Asia and and certainly in Japan, and uh, and they've all been impacted by harvesting for and and loss of habitat, am amazing uh, impacts in in Asia. Uh, and if you're along the shore, again, they're a big part of the diversity of all of the animals just in this tiny little one dredge, you know, blue claws, yeah. spider crabs, horseshoe crabs, fish, flounder. winter flounder, uh, all of the types of things um, are, it's that diversity. And, and that's, that to me has, has been always a major issue and a scary issue as the prime issue, I've always thought. Look at biological diversity, and if we can can corner the protection of of animals and their habitat, a lot of other things will will disappear as issues in my mind. And so I talked about that in Redesigned Earth. And the we talked about uh, how we deal with water resources or how we deal with coastal infrastructure. Sandy, as a, as it wasn't a hurricane, right? I spent three years in the Navy as a hurricane hunter uh, out of um, the uh, Air Jacks. And in 1969, I flew the tail end of Camille. Camille mm -hmm. was a level five hurricane, the strongest, most intense hurricane to make landfall at full blown 21, 22 foot storm surge, 195 miles an hour. It was intense. And I was a tail end of that in, in my flight crew. But I can tell you, um, you had a greater appreciation of what coastal habitat can do. It, right. it will absorb these things, but you can't you can't put a brick house and you can't put a, a corrugated sheet piling um, to <laughs> handle all of that. And Sandy no. did that. And here's Sandy in New York, New York alone, for Long Island, from Brooklyn to Montauk, sixty billion, sixty billion dollars in restoration. And the majority of that restoration went into rebuilding boardwalks, recreational <laughs> facilities, and some more infrastructure. So again, it's the priority, the priority of, of the habitat. Yeah. Protected. And, you know, and, and, and as you're saying, we're removing the animals from the environment in such wholesale. numbers wholesale like this, like, you know, here's a, a, a boatload of crabs that the wardens have, uh, got you know some guy poaching yeah you know, there are a few places where horseshoe crabs are safe but they should all be safe everywhere all the time they're such an iconic species john you mentioned that they are in a class or a category by themselves so actually the level of specialness is equivalent to that of all of the insects they're in a class. Yeah. yeah Insects are in a class. Limulus, the four species of horseshoe crabs are in a, a class along with this level of, of um, recognition as something special. All insects, there might be half a million of them and only four horseshoe crabs. Right. So if you lose one horseshoe crab species, you're losing a quarter of the genetic information that is unique to that class of organisms that that is a, a significant and major comment that is absolutely 
important there. And uh, you saw uh, my colleague with the National Park Service, uh, yeah. and Don is still with the American Literal Society, still doing a lot of work uh, in Jamaica mm -hmm. Bay. Jamaica Bay was a major place for it. We, we Gateway National Recreation Area, uh, when I was chief of natural resources, was the first national park to declare horseshoe crabs off bounds. No collection Excellent. within okay. Jamaica Bay. Now. The way we did it, we said it's part of our natural resources and national parks protect natural resources. But it was a battle. It was a battle with the state. It was a battle with the uh, with uh, fishermen. It was a battle. I mean, literally for uh, decades. Nothing. But but then Fire Island did it. And and then Assateague, Chincoteague and then up and down the coast, all the national parks have basically said, you don't take it out for commercial purposes, which it was for. And you have to leave horseshoe crabs alone. So that was that was a very positive, That's very excellent. positive thing. Um, and th this is happening internationally, and the way it's happening internationally is interesting because um, it, it, you tend to focus in on because there's enough of issues and deal with it locally, and then to broaden it out on a, on a global scale didn't happen for me personally until. We had our first horseshoe crab conference, which was at the time at Dowling College, and uh, Sylvia, you graciously were was there, inspired everyone to really talk about this uh, work and look at all of the activities. And when we published the work out of there, um, the the primary conservation, as far as in uh, encapsulating all conservation. Uh, aspects of all species is the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Right. And IUCN has scientific specialty groups. So uh, it's, it's over uh, 12 years now, 13 years, that we have a, a scientific specialty group for horseshoe crabs. And I'm on the initial group, Mark Botten at Fordham, Paul Shin at Hong Kong University, um, where we were the uh, Glenn Gauvery in Delaware um, and ERDG. And so and Dave Smith from USGS. These were the people coming together. Jennifer Maté at, um, in Connecticut uh, is on the SSG, the steering committee. And what's so important about this is that it's the only aspect on an international basis that identifies horseshoe crabs for the, exactly for the purpose that you mentioned and puts them on the red list. Now, it, it makes it feel good that we got it on the red list, but it makes you feel bad that it had to go on the red list. Right. Yeah. This is on the red list is the endangered sword. species. Right. Yeah. yeah. So all four species are being, uh, the other three, I think uh, Tachyplaeus is one of the Tachyplaeus is on there now, and they're looking at the other Tachyplaeus and the other Carson Scorpius. So all four hopefully will get the added. So acknowledgement and, and protection uh, it, it, and it's it's not a regulatory protection it is just saying these animals are in dire straits they, they and they're so special for the, those special things and that you, you have to kind of make it personal and yeah. everybody said to me you, you you're looking at this and uh, you're, you're a typical ecologist you want to protect everything <laughs> yeah I, okay that's all right i don't mind being typical um but the idea is that there is a practical importance to these animals. And for the most horrendous reason, it became more and more important only in this last two years, 2019 through 2020, uh, because of their blood. And yeah, we're gonna get to the, that now. And that is, that is an amazing acknowledgement of the animal, not because it, has an antiviral capability. Its blood is blue. It's hard. It it costs that amount of of uh, blood from a single horseshoe crab, a few liters. You can see how they're doing. Each of those bottles run about sixty thousand dollars in uh, LAL cost, and uh, it's a four hundred and twenty five million dollar industry, pharmaceutical uh, industry, in three basic pharmaceutical companies in the United States and in one in uh, Japan and China, um, but they're basically housed out of the United States. And um, it does something that has been shown to be unique for our overall human health, because right. it's a bacterial endotoxin detecting system. And that endotoxin detecting system is basically for bacteria. 
And now what would that have to do with the viruses that we're talking about? Well, every year in the United States, 275,000 people die from sepsis. They go into a hospital, one out of every three people going into hospitals, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the black humor, um, funny, you know, you, 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 got to, you go into the hospital to get sick. I mean, the whole idea <laughs> of, of, of uh, contamination by bacterial contamination, gram negative bacteria contamination in your respiratory or circulatory system is, is a death sentence, is sepsis. It's not, not a pretty picture. And so that's what LAL, limitless amoebocyte lysate, the extract from the blood, the amoebocytes help in detect because it's instantaneous, it's 100% or 99.9% efficient and effective. And when you're dealing with somewhere in the neighborhood of, at some point in time, what, 5 billion, 10 billion inoculations? How do you test for all of them to make sure that they're not contaminated? LAL was used for, by NASA for years in this space shuttle uh, program. Every time a space shuttle would go up, they would take a, a satellite up and the satellites were coated in gold, a, ver a thin veneer of gold. And they had to make sure that there was no contamination, any kind of contamination, so that they wouldn't, they would not give uh, faulty readings, even if they were in a vacuum of space. And what did they use to detect that? LAL. So it's been used repeatedly, every hospital, every surgery, every injectable drug, uh, insulin for diabetics, uh, uh, I'm a type two diabetic. I want to make sure I don't I don't take insulin, but I want to make sure that the pharmaceutical chemicals that I take, right, that I'm being, you, they have to be tested at some point. So it's called batch testing, quality control, quality assurance, and all of these inoculations, all of those vials of LAL are going to be tested. All of those vials for the coronavirus uh, inoculation have to be tested, maybe ten thousand at a time. And uh, th that makes them marketable. Then they can sell them or they can then distribute them, but they couldn't just do that. So this is kind of, um, I call it kind of the adjunct assistance that has to do with, with the pandemic. And, and it's with any kind of a, a disease that's associated with, uh, with the xenobiotics. I mean, th this is the tough thing that, that uh, societies have to, to look at, not blame it on anybody, but take a look at, um, human um, physiology and health and horseshoe crabs play an important role whether or not uh, the pandemic happened or didn't happen they were still doing what they were doing uh, every nurse at Malloy College knows about LAL permanent because I tell them about it. but no but <laughs> they, they, know, they know all about it because they they've actually done internships out at the laboratory as Sir what Thomas run out of horseshoe they, crabs What's that? What, what if we run out of course? You, what if there are no more horseshoe <laughs> crabs? What if they're well, gone? You know, the the uh, pharmaceutical companies there are there are a few that have been kind of rivaling uh, getting a synthetic, um, and the FDA has a very strict and and I believe it needs to be strict. I mean, we're dealing with human health here, so that you want to make sure that there's no possibility of that. And uh, we even see look what happened with the even in the pandemic you know, several different types of immunizations. And and um, I got my shots that were uh, Pfizer. I, I don't have any stock in Pfizer. It <laughs> doesn't really matter, but they went through the protocols. They went through the, and they showed that this is the safest, this is the most effective, and therefore others can do it as well. It's, it's, it is competitive. I mean, if we don't believe things that are competitive. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I can say John, we lose horseshoe yeah. crabs. We don't have the effectiveness that we have. Now, maybe we can do that, but... Um, isn't, isn't there a synthetic material that has not yet been approved for use in this country, but it does it's exist? Used in Europe. Yes, in yes, Europe absolutely. Since, uh, and, since 2003. And that, has been, that has been the kind of uh, little debate uh, just recently. Um, I'm all for synthetics. That would definitely help if we can do that. It really, it really seems a way forward. I mean, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, new medicines and, and discoveries from the ocean, right. from the plants and animals that live there, the microbial systems. But it really seems that the key driver needs to be once you identify something, you don't just kind of keep taking that animal just to, you know, exploit it. 
but you put all effort into finding and creating the synthetic equivalent. You use a, nature as the library, the, the, the not guideline. as the mine. Yeah, not as a mine. Yeah. And I, I think that that will that will be happening very soon. I'm hoping sooner than later. Uh, but everything that I've spoken to at FDA and people uh, that have worked for the for um, for the pharmaceutical companies and have retired and left and can say things now that they couldn't say before, <laughs> um, uh, which is interesting, um, all have said, uh, you know, it's it's right at the cusp. It needs to happen. And has to, uh, and, I mean, it, and it should happen soon. And they should be the primary protectors of horseshoe crabs. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're so reliant upon yeah. it. I mean, all of us right now are pretty reliant upon it, whether you're getting a, a tetanus shot or a COVID shot or, or whatever, or you say insulin, whatever it is. But most people have no idea that the, the sacrifice of these animals for our benefit, it's not about eating them. It's about using their special blood. Yeah. And and I do, I've heard, you know, I've, I've been reading quite a lot about, you know, the research on these, and it, it says that they take about 30% of the blood from a crab before they either chop it up for bait, or um, sometimes they try to return them to the ocean. But who knows if they, you know, what the recovery rate is, or if they even recover. That's the worst case scenario, and, and I, I agree that, um, these there are have so been cool. literature wow. says 35 percent. There's there's literature says one or two percent. Depends on who you're talking to and what the what the protocol was for the research. But there there is something there that gets us back to what I believe to be. Uh, and and please understand that I'm not against fishermen necessarily. I'm just I understand that historically and culturally, but and commercially. But the idea is that these animals are the only animals that could be used for bait. And the only reason that that is being said is because they get it for free. In New York, uh, there are 650,000 animals harvested for bait on the East Coast in the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, 650,000. New That's York State insane. issues permits, a permit. You get a permit from New York State. I get a permit from New York State that goes into getting my the crabs that I can harvest 60 a day and I, I don't take I only take just like one days to get them into the lab and maintain them. And then that's a whole other story about the aquaculture of these animals. But getting to the idea of what they get done with if they're bled, if they're in a pharmaceutical, they bleed them, they keep them for 24 hours, and then they're supposed to return them to the main environment that they were collected in. And if you remember way back when we did our first issue at Dowling, we were saying, oh no, they they take them. And they bring them up to Massachusetts. Then they they don't release them there. They say they're going to release them back, but they don't release them. They sell them to fishermen and they chop them up as bait. So they get double duty out of that. And then if you're a fisherman and you collect 60 a day and you chop them up and throw them in a refrigerator, you don't have to spend a penny because you've gotten them all free from a permit. And again, that's the argument that's being made that they're, they're following the permit, they're, they're, the population. The population in New York, three years in a row, identified as poor by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And the only place that is stable, totally stable, is within the preserve because it's a biosphere preserve. No take in that preserve. Now, on the periphery and the outside of the boundary, I tell this story all the time. I, I did... Um, uh, we, we do a lot of academic international travel when I was at Dowling College and here at Malloy College. <clears throat> and we would go to Belize. Um, it's just a wonderful, there's Glover's Reef there, which is a, a, a coral reef atoll. And it's like three and a half hours off the shore of Belize. It's just beautiful um, um, uh, Glover's Reef. And so we would say there that there's, uh, uh, we would, they were doing, uh, the queen conch, the the, oh, yeah. the pink shell, the beautiful shell, the queen conch. So they have a preserve boundary. And so we're giving getting a lecture from the local fishermen to the students one um, afternoon. And all of a sudden he gets, gets a phone call, a cell phone call. And he says, oh, I got to go. I got to go. Got to go. <laughs> takes off. I said, oh, okay, I can't finish your lecture. All right, no problem. So he takes off. And about four hours later, he comes back 
and we were sitting around, the students were sitting around just, you know, having something to eat that evening. And um, he goes, I'm so sorry I had to go, but I, we had to do a law enforcement action. And he s- explains what happens. Fishermen um, go to the boundary of, of the preserve, jump in the water and snorkel into the preserve. And then any conch that are in the preserve that they can get, and we were monitoring them all week by putting out transect lines and going in the water, counting how many there were. And then they just move them, pick them up and put them on the boundary of the preserve. Then they get on their boat and they wait till the next morning. And all of those conch have gone outside of the preserve. They come and they pick them up and they go. So this, this ranger said, I got to catch them before they get back on their boat because yeah, he spotted yeah. them. And so he went and somebody got arrested and all that kind of thing or, or was fine. I never knew what the end result was. I mean, because these things, these poaching things can get pretty dangerous, obviously, Very right? Dangerous. Because not for necessarily for invertebrates, but for it's just about anything these days. But I said, the criminal mind is, is genius. I mean, you know, why don't we apply that to help protect these animals rather than doing that? But economically, it, it made them come up with this idea of putting them on the boundary, wait till they kind of, the, the conch didn't know where they were going necessarily. Yeah, they don't, they don't, they're they don't just, know where the boundary is. <laughs> right. They're grazing off somewhere. There was no line, no light, yeah. light. And so I tell that story all the time because I go, the effort to protect animals long-term is comprehensive and in many respects, can be incredibly frustrating because it can seem to be a reasonable approach to things. Uh, but Barry Commoner, I've been Barry Commoner at Queens College for years. He spoke at the first Jamaica Bay Conference 1980 when I was with the Park Service. And he said to me, he, says, he goes, Jack, you can be incredibly environmentally conscious, dedicated, and really care about the environment and still be wrong. I go, okay, I got that. <laughs> we have to kind of look at all these nuances and bring these things in. And that's important. And, and this is a oh beautiful segue here. This yeah. picture here, how much plastic is in the ocean? Oh my goodness. I mean, there's a problem you would never think would have been as intensive as it is because we, we were, how we were disposing of our trash and our garbage is not like it is today. today it is just out of control. Right. Totally and, out of control. Everything is you, encased, plastic, plasticized. Mm-hmm. And this is just one. Whoop, I see something. Is that me or you? No, I was just saying that the that the you know this shows that you know even um, other kinds of fisheries or or the trash we're putting in the ocean, it can really impact these animals as well. So it's yeah, it's not that we're just like extracting too many, it's but catch. it's but it's the stuff that we're actually putting into the ocean that can entangle them. They've got right. all those little legs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and they get they get wadded up in uh, here in in looks like fishing line or you know some monofilament of some sort, mm-hmm. and it, you know what in their in their long history could prepare them for something like this. Nothing. Not much. Nothing. <laughs> Let alone being having their blood drained out. Yeah. All right, and that's it's and their life cycle is pretty unique. Uh, they go through the the section F there, the trilobite larvae, the juveniles. Oh, yeah. Um, but and, look how cute uh, they are. <laughs> And and they, I'm really, I mean, that's uh, it's the cute factor. I mean, they they're just students, adorable. High school students love it. They do. I love it. I'm just watching them all the time, keeping moving about. Again, the the carapace, the molt, uh, the cycles of doing that. So the, there's the idea of maturation and development. Um, we've we've studied um, a few. We've been looking at ocean acidification as as the global mm-hmm. issue. Um, I have to admit, I mean, you know, you report the science as it's reported. We've only done two small studies, but we're looking at um, some more. Uh, we haven't seen a significant impact in the growth and development. Now, these are laboratory. We don't, we don't really know in, in situ in the, li- in the environment. So, but uh, right now it's giving us some more indications. We're sim- re-simulating um, a, a shoreline in the lab. We're creating with wave action and and maybe um, like a simulated shoreline. So we're gonna take a look at what happens there when there's interaction between the sediment and the ocean waters, uh, rather than just the changes in the pH and the exposure thing. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. Uh, here's the compound eyes of the yeah. bush crab. They've got um, nine, nine eyes, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine, there, ten, a, you know, <laughs> 
But the primitive story. eyes, there oh. are primitive eyes, uh, which are um, called ocelli, and, and it's like it's scallops. Like right? Yeah. Yeah. The and in the, right under the, in the beginning of the prosoma, right in the, just below these eyes, you'll see, uh, I don't know if the next picture. I don't know if we has. have another picture of the eyes or not. Oh. We had a picture of no. one showing the telson and the little right. eyes. Okay. But the uh, the telson has ocelli on it, and right here in the front of the animal, on its uh, on its face there, is uh, two ocelli as well, they, and they're basically light sensitive, so they can detect uh, the light. And, and Nobel and, Prize, uh, you know, one for the studying of the the um, the observational capability of these animals, and especially the, their compound eyes. The other thing I liked about this picture is, you know, a lot of people they see them like this, and they and they think that you know the, like the horseshoe crab is going to get all stabby, right? It's going to like right. poke them. Or, <laughs> but right. you know they're completely harmless and and very gentle animal. They have you know no toxins, no venoms, but they you use the put telson your hand right in there. Yeah, put and you right but the telson is used to to help them steer and then to help them flip over when they get stuck like this, right? Yeah, I, I and that's one of the characteristics that I loved about them because I'm not very brave. So I mean, I just uh, <laughs> I love the idea of these animals are, are approachable and and uh, easy enough to deal with. Very difficult though to aquaculture, and mm -hmm. that has been a real concern because at one point in time uh, we made a proposal to the state that if we could breed the animals at least you know a single female, we've had spawns of 120,000, 200,000 eggs. Now let's say even 10% of that survives and gets them through eight or nine years, 10 years and to sexual maturity. But even that we wouldn't have to worry about. The idea is to release them into the wild. And so you can see here, the, the male appendage, the female appendage and across the uh, prosoma, the, the uh, across the eyes and the, there's the mouth parts and the legs surrounding it and thus the chalicerae. But in its infinite wisdom, New York State DEC does not allow me to release any animals once they come into the lab. Once they're in the lab, that's it. They have to die. We put them in freezers to hold them for study uh -huh. in the future, but we can't release them. And if we give them to high schools and everything like that, the high schools are not allowed to. I jeopardize my permit if I tell them to release them. But, uh, but what about fish hatcheries? John, uh -huh. how do fish hatcheries get away with it then? I, I've argued every kind of aquaculture, and I and they said that we were we, by doing that we'd be stocking horseshoe crabs. And I said, no, the, the animal's life cycle is, doesn't allow for stocking. It has to you have to <laughs> captively rear them and oh, then no. release them. E even it's like um, it's not a good example, but it's, we had uh, Kemp's Ridley turtles nesting off of uh, Breezy Point in the Rockaways. And it's the first time ever recorded. And there was uh, 120 eggs and 80 of them hatched. And every, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Park Service said, release them. And I, I called up and I, I got probably a little indignant, but I just said, "Don't you, you're not giving them a chance. Down in, Fl in Florida and, and in the Gulf, um, they take the, they hold on to the, and these are vertebrates, they hold on to them for six months to eight months, get them a little bit bigger to the point where they have at least a slight chance of surviving. But you put all these, these hatchlings out into the, into the coastline immediately, none of them are going to survive more than likely. Well, right. I lost that battle too. So the idea is to keep pushing to that type of thing. We should be helping in these um, animals. Yeah, Captive breeding yeah, helps as long as they're native species not we're not bringing in uh, tachypleus from uh, hong kong harbor to um, to coney island we're, we're dealing with limulus and it should be part of the 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 long-term plan now th this monitoring is done you can see here mm -hmm. the tagging of, of horseshoe cribs that's a great thing uh, they're tracking them but another part of their survivability uh, the influences on their survivability is they have a tremendous site fidelity Oh, there's the, the 115 locations. This only um, has, um, I think has over 115. Yeah. These are what we monitor every year. 20 years we're doing this. And you could uh, use some volunteers. Even in 2020. We you could use there. more volunteers out there, right? Yeah. Th this year, we uh, last year rather, last summer, we only had five students and myself. 
<clears throat> so I really stretched myself. I had to go to 20 beaches myself. So yeah. really so hard work. Someone had to maybe, do it. Maybe some someone of our viewers can can uh, be in touch and, and come out and help you. Uh, Save the horseshoe crabs. Monitor where Absolutely. these kids are. Be yeah. some more observers for you. And it's easier to do observations these days because we ha we've um, put the longitude and latitude, right? These are all G uh, GPS. You go to the site. You can take a picture and send it, right, on your cell phone. Um, and it's not, we can do the counting or you can walk the beach and, and do the counting. It's really easy. And, uh, and then, but you know, you have all of this, this infrastructure, the rock riprap jetties, yeah. all of those types of things along the coastline. It's always difficult. Um, the coastline is changing all the time. It's not just necessarily sea level rise. It's the idea of more and more human influences. The East coast of the United States from Maine to Florida in the last 75 years has tripled in its population. Wow. Tripled. It's, it's insane. So all it's of that not, is with infrastructure. It's not with the horseshoe crabs, that's with people. Right? People, yeah. People, yes. <laughs> yes, people. So we've got some so, of your, we've got some of your uh, contact information here on this slide. Yeah, and Gigi is posted in the chat, some others, but we, we're at the top of the hour and we have like questions from people. Oh, so okay. I, I am going to attempt to um, oh, get out of the, our slideshow here. Hey, there we are. And go right to some questions. OK, <laughs> Stephanie says, I was always told that when a horseshoe crab was on the beach that it, and it appears dead, it's actually just a shell and the animal has left. Um, is every horseshoe crab on the beach uh, just a shell? Does it move? No, <laughs> but um, again, they molt quite a bit. So to grow, depending on uh, the numbers. And so you'd have to go up to the shell. If you see in the carapace, the portion of the carapace in the front of the horseshoe crab, if it's open, if it's opened, that's where the animal crawls out. And that's a molt. Um, if it's it still has flesh and doesn't have that break in the in the prosoma, then it's dead. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> no. a good rule. <laughs> so Stacy has a really interesting observation. She says, "Last August, on a swim with my friend in Seattle, Washington, we saw a horseshoe crab in about 15 feet of water close to the shore, off the Ike Lighthouse." We have some skeptics in our swim club that believe that we must have mislabeled the sea creature. Um, but uh, my friend Susan is from the East Coast and she's seen horseshoe crabs at the beach and is absolutely certain of the identification. Our question is, how could a horseshoe crab possibly get to the West Coast? Was it maybe dumped from a home aquarium? It's uh, um, maybe, that's a good possibility. Um, I've heard of horseshoe, now I haven't been able to, <laughs> And I have I can't say I spent a lot of time in investigating this, but um, uh, due to the currents along the East Coast, some of these animals might get caught up in the Gulf Stream and get brought over to portions of Western Europe, um, England, and and um, Ireland. And someone told me I never ever I asked to give me you know corroboration of that, but I haven't seen it. But for all intents and purposes, even if there were by some um, coincidence, the animals found on the West Coast, the, um, it's just not the habitat that these animals are normally in. Yeah. So that, that's the only thing I can, I can say at this point. Yeah. But so I, I can't. I, but it was, I, could have been a, a, aberration. an aberration. Yeah, you never she know. She should have taken a photograph. Right. Yeah, we need the photograph next time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Ida says, with the increase of discussion on climate change impacts of the last few years and the increase of discussions of natural-based solutions and green economy, circular economy, do you have any hope that we as humans will start getting better in conservation incentives? Uh, may this give some hope for conservation of horseshoe crabs? I think there's always reason for hope. We were we were talking just before uh, we you know, we went live about you know the potential for making uh, some of these areas where horseshoe crabs are one of the Mission Blue Hope spots and how we can really get public engaged around, you know, 
first an animal, then the habitat, the red knots, and and just bringing uh, seemingly incohesive groups of people together. So you have you know swimmers, birders, people who just love horseshoe crabs, <laughs> um, people that that just love the beach without so much infrastructure, but bringing them together to try to improve these habitats, it it does give us cause for hope. At least it gives me cause for hope. I I. I there's always hope and I appreciate it. And, um, and certainly the hope spot concept that Sylvia has put together is inspirational looking at these types of environments. Uh, but as you get closer and closer to urbanizing um, and to urban sprawl uh, impacts along coastlines um, and that the, the idea that coastlines are the first line of defense against major habitat alterations, we're not talking about uh, generational changes. We're talking about immediate changes, storms and hurricanes and and uh, other uh, tsunamis. So look at Fukushima in Japan, the whole, the whole coastline uh, near that nuclear power plant will be un, not used for a hundred years. That'll be radioactive in that, that plant there. Um, the idea of, I, I, I don't want to get corny about it, but there really is a need for um, an attitude change about the this animal. It's not just the, this oddity or this alien, you know, creature. Um, it is a uh, an organism that has exhibits this this. We use this term all the time, and it has nothing really to do in ecology. It's a lot different to use the word sustainability. It, it has sustained its existence for 445 million years. And it, it survived things that are so such cataclysmic events in earth history that it's almost, the, the cataclysmic event is our, our mind, our ability to take a look at this animal and say, look at what it has done, look what it can do, and we should do everything necessary to preserve it. Now, that has some economic outfall because why not give some kind of credit to fishermen, give them a fishing bait connection so that they purchase only synthetic bait and they don't take horseshoe crabs. Give um, fishermen who are harvesting um, uh, fin fish or doing trawls or taking up uh, clams, bivalves for, for um, harvest, uh, give them an opportunity to um, not anytime there's a bycatch to make sure that it's protected and removed if you're doing trawling. Uh, I mean, there's all of these little, th these uh, checks, right? It's like right. death by a million paper cuts. We want to reduce the paper cuts, be able to have an opportunity to say that the animal's survival is, its, is the priority. And that's why uh, I haven't been successful but the idea of designating horseshoe crabs as a world heritage species by exactly. UNESCO, if that was a primary result, if that could happen, then I think it gives the attention to its the significance. Every country on earth, in the by definition, the pandemic is benefiting from the idea of survival of horseshoe crabs. The Absolutely. idea of coming up with the proper immunization and the treatment and every one of those unfortunate people in hospitals, all of the, the influences in those things all had to do with protection against not only the virus, but reducing the, the collateral damage that's associated with bacterial infection, which is still at the rate that I mentioned before, 275,000 deaths a year in the United States alone. We're not yeah. even talking about, and there are millions of, of hospital operations, millions of each year, and all of those operations depend on endotoxin detecting systems, LAL. Now, you can get other endotoxin chemicals in the pharmaceutical cornucopia of, of pharmaceuticals, uh, but they're not as effective and efficient and instantaneous as LAL is. And that's right now, that's should be the, that has been a target. And I think there are some new companies that have been looking at that. And I pray that they they can, I mean, if they can get jump started a little bit more in funding and then get that into the FDA 
and I think they have applied to the FDA and they're just waiting for them to kind of and do more trials. Maybe, maybe it would help if, if, you know, individual people just start kind of petitioning the FDA to, to accelerate the development and the use of the synthetics or to adopt the use of the synthetics that have right. proven safe. I think, I think that's an end point that could help. And, and yeah, Absolutely. that would be a good thing. There should be a sense of urgency about it because horseshoe crabs are on the decline. There is yes, no, no question about that. You yep. can see that the source of this very, I will say, magical material. <laughs> Magic material. Is we could we could eliminate the source. Let's not do that. Let's use the horseshoe crabs literally as a library. Get the recipe, replicate the active ingredients, and apparently it has been done, or is exceeding is very close. The close is not there if we don't have it available in this country now. Correct. And we, the need is so great, and it really makes it makes no every sense, sense no sense to continue to rely on squeezing the blood out of wild animals. <laughs> oh my God! Right. So that we can have a test that saves human lives. One of the, one of our uh, viewers is asking: Is the lag time between harvesting the blood? Or what is the lag time between harvesting the blood and releasing the live crab if they're released? Is it possible to keep them uh, extra days to give them a better shot at post uh, bleeding survival? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I don't run a pharmaceutical company and I don't know, you know, that it's, it's yeah, their priority. MO, how they operate, how they, what they do. And in the, again, just in New York, 135,000 for bait um, 600,000 overall for harvesting, um, you got to put them back supposedly in the main place. And the, there are places which they're not allowed. And I think that's the key, maybe, maybe just not a, no collection for bait. And uh, the animals that are collected must go back into the exact same environment that they were collected and not. Oh, but they've been in the laboratory. That's, yeah. that's yeah. against what you experienced. Yeah. Once yeah, in the laboratory, you can't put them back, right? Yeah. Right, and the the labs that have been pretty good in this circumstance here, they didn't want to, they cer certainly have, again, an economic uh, interest in looking at this. And so, and they have, they have supported uh, some of the conferences, some of the research. Um, they're, not, they're not sitting back very cavalier about it, but I think it's, it is important. And I think the pandemic has, has you know, brought it more and more to the forefront that until these animals are protected and extinction is something that, like you say, one day you wake up and they're gone. And yeah. that's how it happens. And and it's not, it doesn't, they say, well, the numbers are stable. I says, well, the numbers can be destabilized pretty quickly. And the idea of, of um, no restrictions on taking them for bait how could you argue that that taking them for bait doesn't have an impact? They're gone. They're, they're yeah. not breeding anymore, and they they concentrate more on the females, even though they've tried to go just take males. But you got to have somebody monitoring that. You got to have somebody over the shoulder every fisherman, and that that's Perfect. never going to happen. Yeah, never, never. Happen. So I'm going to kind of because we're running short on time, and I know you have to go to a class very soon. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll combine a couple of these questions. Um, April and Jenny are are asking um, how much do we really know about the life cycle um, at the time when the horseshoe crab is not showing up on the beach and what is the time period for tagging horseshoe crabs does it go for weeks or months or years uh the, you mean tagging when did they get recaught yeah identified? um well again they, they, they have a tremendous site fidelity so depending on where they're tagged more than likely they'll be in that same region. In other words, New York crabs are not going to Florida, no matter how the temperature is. <laughs> it's not happening. So the idea of the of the the tagging and, and the numbers and, and who's monitoring them, it's like all, all things that are monitored. I mean, CIRCOM's primary purpose as a field station is monitoring. And that's intensive. But usually monitoring is the first thing that gets cut in budgets. And mm -hmm. we have felt it, you know, and we were mostly volunteers, but um, there's only three of us at the, at the lab right now. 
and we concentrate on students. So we have uh, summer is active with at least 15 students. Other than last summer for COVID restrictions, there had to be only one student per lab per day, that type of thing. And so it was, we, we worked it out. Everybody did it, everybody would be tested and we had all the kind of things that were going on and people got their shots because they're associated with the, uh, education. And um, so, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna bring up this next year, but it didn't take away the idea of harvesting the numbers of permitted in New York state. And we still can't release any of them. And um, they're still exotic foods. And you go to you go to YouTube, look up horseshoe crabs. They don't tell you about their biology. They tell you about how you can use their carapace for a bowl. You know, so <laughs> it's just awful. That's where it is. But well, I, not, I could leave a uh, takeaway, three little things that if yes, I please, I can what be can so we do? This. because thank you. You have been amazing today. I, I just really appreciate this. And I, I but the World Heritage designation. Somehow, um, you know, I, I'm not the best at, at getting that kind of massive movement going, but it really does need to be uh, a, an opportunity. The idea of writing to the FDA and talking about the LAL and the, and the idea of why, because the debate is taking the circumstances. And then the, those, it is a voluntary type of thing. We do, there was years ago, we had quite a few volunteers um, and it, it's a dedication. It's um, it, it's important. But any organization, any group, there's. A, I'm not the only horseshoe crab individual uh, around. Certainly not even in New York. So there's tons of groups that are looking and monitoring. But it's data, data driven. And if they don't accept the data just because it's coming out of a college and it doesn't, it's not coming out of federal government or out of a state government or out of uh, NGO, um, that that is a hurdle that's very difficult to overcome. We've got 20 years worth of data, and all we have shown is the population is slowly declining on Long Island, which has been identified and, and admitted to by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and that the habitat is being lost at a greater rate, up to 8%, yep. and the population is about 1%. So again, um, you got to look at all data, talk about it, and it's it, it's not only ignored, but it's kind of dimin uh, it, it it's not taken seriously and, and I, that I find them. very difficult yeah. yeah well john thank you so much for all your time today champion of the horseshoe crab and i hope all our viewers Thanks, hope all our viewers will um you know reach out to you and and those that live locally near nearby or up and down the coast can reach out and figure out like where they can go to help the horseshoe crab and and become, uh, you know, citizen, help with some citizen science projects, support the um, a new hope spot in the area or, yeah. or hope spot wherever you have horseshoe crabs. Let's let's get that going. And have a network of a uh, horseshoe crab hope. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep thinking, if we found a living dinosaur, people would be all over it and be in you know sense of wonder. Oh, look at this amazing animal! These creatures were around, you know more than a hundred million years before dinosaurs and they're still around yep. show them some respect oh my goodness yes that shows that that's really the definition of resilience right that's really yep. what should be well, that should be the time should be using what's going awe. on there with awe and respect <laughs> so well thank you everyone thank you so so much really I'd like appreciate to thank it. I'd like to thank the Ocean Elders, our sponsors, and and of course to our our community who keeps coming, coming back in. and yeah. diving in with us. Um, water truly connects us all. Yes. You make us believe in a dive in as a conversational platform, and we are so grateful to everyone. We're going to be back on April fifteenth. Yes. We'll take a little hiatus, but we'll be back on April fifteenth. We'll be talking with uh, my diving instructor, John Englander, about uh, climate and sea level rise. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And before we go, to remind everyone, take care of the ocean. Yes. As if your life depends on it. Because, because it, it does. does. <laughs> Thanks so much. Really, thank you, Sylvia, Liz. Thank it's you, everyone. An honor to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Take care Bye -bye. now.